where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you, everyone. guys are happy to be here once again? Amen. 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 So this morning I want to talk about uh, a sermon entitled, Through Jesus' Eyes. What did I say? Through Jesus' Eyes. Through Jesus' Eyes. And I've um, also subtitled it, Treasures in Heaven. What did I say? Treasures in Heaven. So uh, one of the things I like to do um, I like to watch tech review videos. Um, I like technology. I think it's fascinating. And one of the things I do from time to time, I don't do it regularly, but from time to time I like to watch reviews on technology, the latest technology that comes out and everything, etc. And one time I was watching one of those videos on electric cars, EVs, electric vehicles. They're very fascinating, I, 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 I think. But anyway, I was I learned about this. Um, I think, it's a, I think it's a mic. microphone. Sorry. All right, let's go ahead and use this one. So um, I learned about this um, new vehicle that Tesla put on display back in 2000. Oh, hello. Back in 2017. 2017. It is called the, let me see the name, Roaster 2.0. And so they talk about all the nice features that you get, that that vehicle had, how you can get up to, you know, um, you know, uh, over 60 and under three seconds, and it has this much uh, electric range. Because um, electric vehicles, they don't operate the same way as 
gas vehicles, right? Gas uses gas and they have a combustion um, engine. And um, uh, when it comes to an electric vehicle, on the other hand, they only have a motor, right? And, and that motor will keep that car going up to certain range. It will give you certain um, amount of mileage based on how much charge that it has, right? And it gives you all those features, and and um, they end up telling the people that were present there, like, if you want one of those cars, you um, all you have to do is wire transfer two hundred and forty-five thousand dollars to Tesla to be first in line to receive the car, right? And a lot of people who were eager to get their hands on that fancy vehicle, that super super powerful electric vehicle, went ahead and did that. And today we, is 2022, June, June 25. And you know, you want to hear something sad? Yeah. They still have not received the vehicle till today. And the point, the, what I found really fascinating was the point that, that that gentleman made. The point that he made was that if those same individuals had taken that $245,000, which is a quarter of a million dollars, by the way, if they had taken it and invested instead in Tesla stocks, it would be worth today more than four million dollars. So, it's, you know, they give um, Tesla pretty much a, 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 a interest-free loan when they could have invested, right? They wanted to invest in a car or buy a car because you can't really invest in a car because the minute you walk off the parking lot, it's going down in value, right? An investment is, is when you essentially put money into something expecting a return, right? How many of you have ever invested in something before, right? And it's not just money, sometimes we invest in relationships, right? You, we, we put our time and our energies and our emotions into the relationship expecting something good in return, right? Expecting maybe a wife or a husband or uh, a best friend for life, a BFF, right? And so a lot of times when we invest, we expect a return, right? Jesus talked about investment in the book of Matthew. Matthew uh, chapter 5 to 7 is where we find what we know as what? The Beatitudes. Well, the whole, the whole three chapters, what do they sum up? Uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Sermon um, on the Mount, I believe, is three of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. And, you know, I would not like this option, but if I had to pick only three chapters, I probably would pick them. I really would. It's three of my favorite chapters, if not my three most favorite chapters in all of Scripture. And we're going to pick up in verse 19, the 19 to 21. It's a very familiar text. And I'm going to read it for you from the New American Standard Bible. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. Matthew chapter 6, reading verses 19 to 21. Are you there? Amen. 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 All right. The Bible says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure where? On earth. On earth it says, Where moth and was the, does what? Co op. The King James Version says, The NASB says, Destroy. It says, in where tears break in, in what? And still, but store up for yourself treasure where? In heaven, because in heaven, neither moth nor rust destroys, and where tears do not break in or still, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let me ask you a question. So according to Jesus, is it wrong to store up treasures? Is it a bad idea to store things, store treasures? Is it a bad idea? No, right? The answer is no. It's not a bad idea to store up treasure. What Jesus is saying is, it's a bad idea to store treasures where? On earth. Because when you store treasures on earth, we can expect one of three to four things to, to happen to it. A lot of bad things can happen to it, right? If we invest in cloth, you know what will happen to it? It will get destroyed by moth, right? Look at this beautiful sweater that used to be very, um, very evenly spread out, you know, very nice, probably something I would wear. But do you notice all those holes in there? 
So a lot of people invest their money in clothes. I remember growing up, I had a friend, he collect sneakers. I did that too, um, but I retained it since. But he collect those, uh, those uh, Nike sneakers, and then I remember back in those days, but that was back when I was a teenager. I'm probably gonna review my age here. But we would wear matching hat, matching um, um, t-shirts, and matching sneakers. They all had to match. And we don't wear it twice the same week, you know? So on, on Monday, we wear the blue shirt and the blue sneakers and the blue hat, right? And then we would change it up. My friend had a weight money that day. He had literally a stack that was probably this long or longer in this house of sneaker boxes, right? All the sneakers were in the original Nike box and he put a drape over it, right? And some of them cost as much. I think the most expensive one he had was $300, right? Um, that was back in 2003, by the way. That was old, you know, it's not, I, I don't know how, if $300 is still a lot of money, but back then it was a lot of money for a sneaker, right? And, you know, and, but is that the best investment he could make with his money? I mean, he had like a, a good $3,000 plus dollars sitting in his bedroom, right? And um, I, let me tell you when, how the Lord um, got that habit out of me, by the way. I used to collect those sneakers to $90, $150 plus, and et cetera. So one time I had spent 90 bucks on a sneaker, which was a lot of money for me back then, because I had just gotten a job. I was about 18 years old. And I bought the sneaker, and I went to my church, you know, for vespers that night. And um, the, the head deacon asked me to help him with this gate that was falling apart, right? It's a wire, uh, it's a chain link um, fence gate. You guys know what I'm talking about? And you know what they have at the bottom? They have sharp little edges at the bottom, right? So I helped him, I moved it, and he went straight on top of my sneaker that I was wearing for no more than three hours. <laughs> And I was like, that's a lot of money down the drain. So I decided not to do that anymore, right? So not everybody is like me though, right? Some other people prefer to put their money in other things like cars, for example, right? Cars are most, for the most part, made out of what? Metal. And what happened to metal over time? They rust, right? And some cars nowadays, for the most part, are made out of plastic. And what happened to plastic? They break, right? It cracks, and they get scratches all over them. And the unfortunate thing is, over time, that nice-looking BMW will look something like this, right? My wife and I, we had a Corolla that we got rid of a few months ago. The front of the, 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 the hood looked like that car, um, and the top of the car looked like that, right? So if you're going to put your money on something like that, right, is it, is it a good investment? Jesus says it's a bad investment, right? But if you are wiser than me and you're wiser than that guy that bought this car, right? And you decide to invest your money on something that's a little bit um, more enduring, like gold or diamond, right? Or even um, cryptocurrency, you know, you guys know about that, right? That's not something that can rust, is it? It's not something that moth can eat, is it? It can vanish overnight, exactly, right? So the next warning Jesus gave us is that if it doesn't rust and if it doesn't get eaten, thieves will may break in and steal it, right? So it doesn't have to be even something physical. There are cyber thieves, you know that? Yeah. People can literally go into your bank account electronically and take all the money out and transfer it to their account, right? And so Jesus has no problem with us storing up treasures the only thing he's telling us, be careful where we store them, right? And he continued on to say, where we store our treasures, what's, what's going to happen to our hearts? It'd be in this very same place, right? So now let me ask you a question. Does Jesus care about our happiness? If he did not, he would not mention that part, right? So in other words, there's a principle in scripture, right, that we find here. The principle is that whatever your treasure is, your heart will follow. Does that make sense? So if your treasure is sneakers, guess what? Your heart will follow, right? So when I scratched my $90 sneakers, you know what happened to my heart? My, my heart was scratched, right? Um, when um, my wife's 
nice coal are starting to get all rusty. You know what's starting to happen to our heart? It's starting to get all, a little sad. It's like, you know, a nice little car. Um, I believe it was the sun, by the way, Arkansas sun that really burned it up. But anyway, that's a whole other topic for another time. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Your heart, your affection, whatever you, you treasure, your affections will go wherever it goes, right? So Jesus says, don't lay treasures on earth where it's very, very unsafe to store them. Store them in heaven, right? So how many places can we store our treasures? Two. Heaven or earth? On earth, it's unsafe. In heaven, it is safe, right? It is safe. Well, it's not just safer. It is safe, right? No thieves can steal it, no moth can eat it, no rust can corrupt or destroy it, right? And, and the other thing to keep in mind is this. So, if, if I wanted to know what it is like to live in Haiti, I'm from Haiti, I was born and raised in Haiti. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention to you, um, yesterday I was officially... I had officially become a citizen of the United States of America. Yes. So, but anyway, let's say you wanted to know what it's like to live in Haiti, right? Yeah. Who better in this room would you ask how it's like? You. Me, why? You were there. I was born and raised there, right? Now, let's say you want to know what it's like to live in Washington State. Oh, I know what it's like. That's crazy. <laughs> Okay, so you've been there, I suppose. I lived there for five years. There you go, you see? So, so Jesus is telling us to lay up treasures in heaven in place of earth. What gives him the credibility to be able to say that, other than the fact that he's God? You know what? He's been in both places, hasn't he? He lived on earth for 33 and a half years, and he lived in heaven his whole entire life, right? So if anybody can tell you which place is the best place to store up your treasure, there's nobody better than Jesus himself. Amen? You know, um, I watch a lot of videos that, you know, of people telling you the best place to raise your family or the best place to go if you want to start a business or whatnot. And a lot of those um, videos, people are basing their opinion upon things that they found on the internet. Right? And which isn't bad, right? The internet is a good place sometimes, right? And none of them are necessarily speaking from experience, because not all of us has the opportunity or ability to travel everywhere and live everywhere long enough to be able to tell people which one is the best one. Does that make sense? But Jesus, on the other hand, he has. He lived on earth and he lived in heaven. He knows which place is the best place to store treasures. Now, the question is, how can we lay up treasures in heaven? Have any of you been there? Can you mail it there, you know, like you put it in a Walmart shipping box and you put it in there and you put a stamp on it and you send it with Gabriel, can you do that? So how can you do that, right? Because we can't physically go there, can we? And what exactly are we able to store up in heaven, right? Can, can you store up anything that you want in a bank? Not usually, right? Typically a bank can store up money there, right? Because they that's what they that's what they're there for. They exist to help people save their money, right? So now imagine you have somebody that lives in your house, right? And that person decided that they're gonna start collecting bones and they wanna store it no other place than in your fridge. How many of you would be okay with that? Nobody? Okay? Okay, let's say uh, that person wants to collect anti Cars, right? Cars from 1909. Anyone uh, rebuild them? What's that? Cars from 1909? Okay, okay, that's not important. So let's say they want to collect all those empty cars and rebuild them, right? And if all of a sudden your front yard and backyard become a junkyard, right? How many of you would be okay with that? No, right? Because um, the reality is now, now let's say you were just like them, right? You love antique cars and you collect them as well, right? And they want to store their antique cars in your backyard. Are you okay with that? Do you think you'd be okay with that? 
would. Yeah, you would because you collect the same thing, right? You put the same amount of value they put on it as they do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be putting treasures in heaven, right, we must be putting um, things that heaven see as valuable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because guess what? I mean, if I, if you put a bone in my fridge, you know what's going to happen to it? It's going to be in the trash. It's not going to be in my fridge because I don't want no bones in my fridge. You understand me? So, huh? As you need to do. Yeah, we have a giant dog that will be buried in minutes. And, but, you know, if, if, if you put something that I value, like let's say you put some vegan ice cream in there, it, it probably won't be there, but it won't be it won't be missing for the wrong reason. You understand what I'm saying? Because I, I like it too. So to determine um, what to put in heaven, we must see it from the perspective of someone who lives there, right? You know, Jesus, we are told, is heaven all in one gift. And notice what Jesus says about the way we esteem or value things in contrast to the way that God does. Notice this. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Um, it says, that which is what? Highly esteemed. Highly esteemed. What's another word for highly esteemed? Very important. Very important or, what did you say? Valuable. Valuable. You have something that you put a lot of value on. It says, that which is highly esteemed among men is what? An abomination in the sight of of God, right? So, what is that text saying? So, a lot of things that we place a lot of value upon are the things that um, God detests. Things that God has absolutely no regard for, right? You know, like whether it's the praise of men or fame or fortune or big houses and whatever. These are things that are highly esteemed among men, right? And, you know, especially when it comes to character traits, right? I remember, you know, growing up in sports and watching those uh, 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 basketball players dunking on, on each other. These were things that I used to love to watch. Like, whoa, you know, like overreacting. And these are, these are things that are highly esteemed among men, right? These type of behaviors in heaven, guess what? They are an abomination. You understand what I'm saying? Pride is an abomination, right? Arrogance, selfishness, these are all things that we, as natural human beings, highly cherish, but in heaven, they are an abomination, right? So in a lot of things that we think so collects, whether it's the nice and fast face, fancy cars or the nice and fancy houses, I'm not saying there's anything in of themselves wrong with those things, as you will see later in the sermon, but a lot of those, a lot of reason, a lot of times, the reason why we are collecting those things is to parade our pride and our arrogance, right? In these things, we are told by Jesus or an abomination in the sight of God, right? So, so notice here a text that many of you are very familiar with. Revelation chapter 21, verse 21. That's easy to remember. Revelation 21, 21. It says, um, it says the 12 gates were what? 12 pearls, every um, several gates were of one pearl, and the streets of the city were pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Now, you may be wondering, what does that have to do with anything? So, question, do people normally pave their streets with gold? Why not? Well, for one, of, one of the things is they may not have the ability to do so, right? But another reason why is because people don't really have that much gold to spread and, and cover I-30, right? Right? Um, they don't have that much of it. And thirdly, it's too valuable to put on the streets, right? That's right. You understand what I'm saying? Have you guys ever heard the phrase, um, walk all over? You know, like somebody says, she walked all over him or he walked all over mm -hmm. her. Do they normally mean that in a literal sense? No, no right? What do they mean by that? Taking advantage or to treat as what? Inferior or lesser than, right? So, what is my point? Could it be possible? Okay, question. Do you think Jesus is going to pave? 
his streets with gold to parade his pride, to show how much gold he has. Why do you think he's doing that? Could it be possible the reason why he's doing that is to show us how little value he has for gold? That maybe there is something in heaven that is far more valuable than gold, far more valuable than pearl. Could it be possible? Right? Because this isn't a book of Revelation, right? This is heaven made new, right? This is the new Jerusalem, right? So Jesus is, in my belief, is sending a very clear message, right? The things that many of us would love to have more, right? He uses it as pavement on the streets, right? The things that many people would put in a chest inside a safe box, which is inside another safe box, which is another inside a giant safe box, right? He used it as a gate. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, those things that we would die for and, and give all that we have for, right? Heaven doesn't put that much um, value upon, right? So we're trying to look what treasure is like to Jesus' eyes, right? So, now, let's take a, 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 another look, another angle here, right? So, if I were to ask you, you know, how many of you love payday? There's nothing wrong with loving payday. You can't raise your hand. Yeah, you know, you work, right? At the end of the, uh, at the, end of the work week, whether, or at the beginning, back when I used to work at Jiz Penny, uh, payday was Monday. And Monday was always a happy day because you get paid, right? Except for when you get paid after taking off a lot of time off work. Have you guys ever had that? Were you excited that you get to go home early? I mean, you, can you relate, right? And until payday come and you'll have, oh, I'll give you $100 this week, right? <laughs> because I'm only work a few hours. But anyway, we typically rejoice when we receive something that we value. Does that make sense? Is it wrong to value money, by the way? Am I saying it's wrong? Is Jesus saying it's wrong? No, right? But it depends on what kind of value you put on it, right? Everything has a price. Everything has a amount of worth associated with it, right? We just got to put the right one, right? So what do you think in heaven bring a lot of joy to people that dwell there? What do you think? I'll tell you. Luke chapter 15, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gave us three parables. Three parables. You have the parable of the lost. Anybody help me out, please? The parable of the lost sheep, okay? And then you have the second one, the parable of the lost coin. And the last one is the parable of the lost sons, plural, right? There was two sons that were lost. Most of us only emphasize on the one that was obviously lost, but both of them were, right? And what I like about that story is how Jesus ended each parable, right? In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says, in concluding the story, right, of that shepherd that left the, 90, the other 99 sheep and went after that one that went astray, Jesus says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be where? In heaven, over one sinner that repented more than over ninety and nine just person which needed no repentance, right? So what happened when one person come back or come into the kingdom of heaven by faith? What happened in heaven? There's a great joy, right? There's, and if you look further down, you'll find that there's a big party, right? And heaven go all out to throw that party, right? Notice what verse 10 says after the uh, parable of the lost coin. It says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. And at the end of that story, right, when that son came back and repented, right, and said, Father, uh, meet me as one of your higher servants, which he never got to say. That's a whole other sermon altogether, right? But notice how Jesus concluded it. He says, but the father said unto his servants, bring forth what? Yeah, the best robe. Not just one of the robes. Bring the best one, right? And put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring him the what? what which calf? The, the fatty one. The fattest one you could find. Bring that one, right? And kill it and let us eat and let us be merry. 
For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry, right? So when uh, um, someone is in a lost condition, according to um, Jesus, right, that person is seen as someone who is dead, right? So in other words, when someone that you love dearly died, is it is it something that you rejoice over? That's typically something that your heart breaks over, right? You get really sad about it, right? So that's how heaven feels when you and I are in a lost condition. Does that make sense? And when that flip, do we just like we are resurrected from the dead? Isn't that something? That can you imagine? Someone you love dearly come back to life. The By the way, Okay, yeah. So if that were to happen, a lot of us would rejoice, right? We would celebrate, right? And by the way, that is going to happen, isn't it? At the second at, at the first resurrection. And that's how heaven feels when we come to Jesus, right? When we um, come to ourselves, right? And notice here, what is heaven's most prized possessions? Go with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 18 to 19. When you, when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, amen. reading verses 18 and 19. I heard two amen. Anybody else there? I'm there. Can I read it? Um, sure, go ahead. Yep, verse 18 and 19, 1 Peter chapter 1. Yes. For as much as ye know that ye will not be dealing with corruptible things, as so are those from your main conversation received by petition from your father, but with the perfect blood of Christ, as of a man without sin and without spot. Amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Eddie. And I'm reading again. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, what's another word for redeem? Brought back, right? Um, imagine, you know, I live in, uh, in Haiti, we have a lot of kidnapping. And a lot of people have to be redeemed, literally, because they were kidnapped and they won't let them go until that price is paid, right? And we were taken captives too, once upon a time, right? We were taken captives by Satan, right? And Jesus had to buy us back, right? And, you know, did Jesus come with $2 million or $2 billion? Did he come with a nice briefcase um, with a lock on it, right, to pay for our ransom? No, no right? The Bible says, we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, right? So what did Jesus pay to buy us back? His blood, right? So if... Um, <clears throat> if I were to ask you how um, something is, uh, how value is placed on something, what would you say the answer is? How is the value of a thing determined? That's right, that's right. So in other words, the worth of something is determined by how much someone is willing to give for it. Like, you may not be willing to give that much for it, right? But if, as long as there's at least one person who's willing to pay that price, guess what? That's how much it's worth. Like, for, for example, that Roaster 2.0, to me, it's not worth $245,000. First of all, I don't have it. Secondly, that's a lot of money, right? And, but for some people, it's worth it. So much so that they literally wire transfer out of their bank account that amount to Elon Musk and his um, team, right? So... The worth of something is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for it, right? So, what is your worth to Jesus? Based on that, what is your worth to Jesus? His life, right? 
his blood, that is your worth to Jesus, right? So your worth is not determined by anything that you do. It's not determined by anything that you are, per se, right? Your worth is determined by your creator, your maker, right? And your redeemer. Jesus, when Satan kidnapped us with sin, Satan said, hey, um, if you want them back, you're going to have to lay down your life. And Jesus said, I'm willing to do that. I believe they are worth my life. Amen. So, it, it, and the saying is true for every soul, isn't it? Is it true only for Sister Judy? Is it true for only the brother Sean and, and Judea and whatever your name is? Is it true only for you or is it true for every single individual on this planet? Is it true for that for that beggar that we see on the corner side of Walmart parking lot? Are they worth that much? Are they worth the blood of Jesus? You know, like, um, if you look on the internet right now, you'll find that Elon Musk is the richest man in planet Earth. The whole world, nobody is richer than him. His net worth is, is estimated to be $219 billion. That's a lot of money. By the way, I don't think you can count to that much in your life. If you had to count one by one, you cannot count to that much in your life. Like, think on that one. Right? And interestingly enough, let me show you something. Um, so all of you know who this person is, right? All of you know who this is? Right? Okay, now tell me, how many of you know who this guy is? Okay, I didn't know who he was until yesterday. His name is Jerome Kevgiel. Or, um, I forgot, I, I misspelled it there. So anyway, do you know why I put his picture up there? Elon Musk is known to be the world's richest man. He, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. He is known as the world's poorest man, okay? He is uh, estimated to have a net worth of six, negative $6.7 billion. That's when he owes that much in debt. Does that make sense? $6.7 um, billion. So, by the way, just to put it in perspective, right? Um, Donald Trump's net worth is about $3 billion. Um, Oprah Winfrey's net worth is about 2.7 billion, and Tyler Perry's net worth is about 1 billion, right? You combine all of them together, their wealth is less than this man's debt. Debt. Does that make sense? This man is poor, right? By the world's standards. But according to Jesus, what is his worth in contrast to Elon Musk's um, worth? Anybody know? What is their worth? It's the same. Their worth is the blood of Jesus. Amen? And this is from Christ Subject Lessons, page 118, paragraph 2. It says the parable says the parable of the merch, uh, merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Notice what um, Spirit of Prophecy said is the worth or value of one's soul. This is one of my favorite quotes from all of the desire ages. It's not, it's not my favorite. It says, one soul is of such value that in comparison with it, worlds sink into what? Insignificance, right? So when Jesus came to die for us, right? He did it for the whole world, but you know who he did it for specifically? He did it for you, right? Even if only one of us were to accept his sacrifice, Jesus would gladly do it. I have something here. And I need your help. I know some of you may not have the best vision, but how many of you can tell me what this is? A dollar. It's a $20 bill, right? So now, let me ask you a question. 
Who determines how much this is worth? No, the name is on there. Who determines how much this is worth? Well, <laughs> well, that's the president. The Federal Reserve, right? The United States Congress or the Treasury, they determine this to be worth 20 US dollars, right? Are you following? So how much is this worth? $20. 20 billion, um, um, 20 dollars. I wish it was worth 20 billion, right? Now let's say I wish to do this with it, right? How much is it worth now? Vincent says zero. This is still worth twenty dollars, right? Okay, now let's say I want to do this to it. How much is this still worth? It's still worth twenty dollars, right? But why is it that so many of us have a hard time understanding that about ourselves? Does that make sense? No matter what Satan has done to you or to your to that man that we see begging on the corner of, of Walmart parking lot, guess what? They still worth the same amount of price that Jesus paid for them, aren't they? Yes. And so, why am I saying all this? Why am I talking about the worth of a soul? Could it be possible that this is what true treasure looks like? Listen to this quote here. So what are we able to store up in heaven? It says, a character formed according to the divine likeness is what? The only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. So the only thing that you can take from this world and carry with you to the next is your character, right? So when you think about it, based on that quote, what in your life is worth more than your character? Nothing, right? Nothing is worth more, right? Because guess what? If you have a $2 billion house, guess what? Can you take that with you in heaven? No, right? If you have a $4.2 billion million car, can you take that with you in heaven? I think that's one of the most expensive cars in the world, right? The only thing that you can take with you is your character, right? But you know what else you can take with you in conjunction to that? Listen to this. Um, this is from Toss from the Mouth of Blessing. It says, The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians, What is our hope, our joy, and crown of rejoicing? What causes us as Christians to rejoice more than anything else? It says, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at this coming? For you are what? You are our glory and joy. In other words, what we rejoice in, what makes our heart pumps, what makes us very, very, very happy and excited is the joy of knowing that one day you will be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And she continued to say, this is, uh, this is Ellen White. She quoted that text and she said this, this is the treasure for which Christ bids us labor, right? Jesus says, lay not up for yourself treasures on where? On earth, but in heaven, right? Because, he says, he says two reasons why we should not, we should not store them on earth, but in heaven instead. He says, if you store them on the earth, right, he will get either destroyed or stolen, right? But if you store it in heaven, it won't get stolen and it won't get destroyed. And he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? So the treasure that Jesus is talking about is not gold, it's not pearl, it's not silver, it's nothing like that, right? Because Peter, what did Peter say about gold and silver, by the way? Do you guys remember? For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, you know what's another word for corruptible, by the way? Perishable, right? Um, my wife and I, on a weekly basis, we buy perishable foods like like bananas and, and cabbage and, and carrots, right? Although we have a fridge, guess what will happen sooner or later if we don't use them? They're gonna perish. Does that happen to gold and silver, necessarily? In a literal sense, does that happen? No, but according to heaven, they are perishable. They are just like a piece of broccoli, right? And so 
Um, the book um, says, this is the treasure for which Christ bids us labor. Character, it says, is the great harvest of life. In every word or deed that through the grace of Christ shall kindle in one soul an impulse that reaches where? Yeah. Heavenward. It says, every effort that tends to the formation of a Christ-like character is what? Laying up treasures in heaven. So every effort you made to form right character, Christ-like character, guess what? You are laying up treasures in heaven, right? And um, she continues. She says, where the treasure is, what's going to happen? There the heart will be. In, in every effort to benefit others, not just ourselves, right? Because we're not called to be selfish, but we're called to be um, selfless, right? We are called to make disciples, right? It says in every effort to benefit others, we benefit who? Ourselves. It says, he who gives money or time for spreading the gospel enlists his own interest and prayers for the work and for the souls to be reached through it, his affections go out to others, and he is stimulated the greater devotion to God, that he may be enabled to do the greatest good. Now, what am I trying to say? This is what I'm trying to say. Tre true, tre true treasure is determined by heaven, and according to heaven, there is nothing more valuable than the creatures which Christ has created and has given his life for, right? Like, you know, imagine you had a, you know, a car or whatever that you spent all that you possess to have. Would you treat it like a common thing? Would you treat it like that $20 bill that was rolling on the ground? Is that how you're gonna treat it? Uh, uh, yeah, you treat it with respect and with care. Why? Because of how much you gave for it, right? Heaven gave everything that he has for you. That's the work that heaven has placed upon you. So, you know, if you can imagine, there's like a little Christ tag on top of your head. You know what it says? It's the infinite symbol with the blood of Jesus all over it. That's your worth. That's the worth of everyone that you come in contact with, right? So, um, and as I close, I want to share with you the story. So, there's this movie I once watched. If you want to know what it is, I'll tell you afterwards. It's actually something that I would not, uh, I would actually recommend is, um, if you, you know, watch movies. Uh, it's one of the best things you can watch. Um, it's a movie entitled um, Courageous. How many of you have ever seen that movie? Okay. It's one of my favorite, right? So what, one, of, one thing I remember from that movie, right? So in that, at the beginning of the movie, there was this um, guy, he was coming, he was traveling, right? He, I think he was traveling back home, right? Um, he moved somewhere else and he was coming back home. And he, he stopped at this gas station to fill up with gas, right? And he finished filling up his gas and he started his car getting ready to go back on the road and as he, as he looked up, you know, getting ready to drive, he noticed that his windshield was full of dirt and dead bugs. I mean, how many of you guys ever had a long road trip? You know what I'm talking about, right? So his windshield is filled with dead bugs and dirt and mud and etc. right? So he's like, okay, let me clean it. Let me clean it up a little bit, right? So he left his car, he, um, he walked out of his car and he went to the, the sponge squeegee. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about? That little thing that you used to clean the windshield. He got one of those and as he, Pull it out, you know, there was no, no fluid in there, right? There was no solution, no water, no soap whatsoever. So he decided to walk over to the next pump where he saw another squeegee, grab it, but as he's grabbing it, he looked behind him, a car jacker jumped into his car and drove off with it. And this man did the craziest thing you can imagine. You know what he did? Instead of calling the police, this man jumped on top of the car, like right next to the driver's side, trying to wrestle the man to get him to stop, right? And as I'm watching, I'm like, man, this guy really loves his car. And he, I mean, he's going down the street, dodging cars, and he's just holding on, trying to get the team to stop the car, right? 
And then finally, after wrestling with him for like a good two, three minutes, they went ahead and crashed into a tree and the car was total. And then um, the guy that was trying to steal the car, well, the guy rolled off to the side of the road while the car hit the tree, right? And as the guy is trying to gather himself, right, the car thief of friends came by and said, let's go, man, let's go. And so he jumped in that car and took off, right? And then these ladies that saw what was happening came to this guy's help. One of them was calling the police while the other one was trying to get the guy to remain calm, right? He said, stay there, stay there, the police is coming. But the guy was determined, he's keep calling to us a car. I'm like, man, this guy really, really loves the car. And the lady said what I was thinking. She said, sir, don't, we're calling for help. Don't worry about the car. And he said something that back then, like I watched that thing like four or five years ago. Back then, it didn't really mean much to me. But he said something now I can resonate with. He says, I'm not worrying about the car. As he opened the door, it revealed what he was worrying about. You know what he was worrying about? He was worrying about his baby in the back seat. That was the reason why he put himself in harm's way. That was the reason why he was literally holding on to that car with all his might, not allowing that thief to get away. It wasn't because he was he liked that car so much. It was because he loved and treasured what was in that car, right? And so as we close, I just want to make two very specific but simple appeal. And the first one is this. Like we, I, I want to invite you to ask Jesus to help you see humanity through his eyes, right? Jesus doesn't see what many of us see, right? He doesn't see a loser or whatever term the world may have placed upon you. He doesn't see $219 billion net worth or $200 net worth, right? He sees his blood, right? With an infinite symbol and blood all over it. That's what he sees, right? And today I want to invite you. If you have not already seen humanity through that lens, I want to invite you to stand up. That the Lord will help us to be able to see humanity through the eyes of Jesus, right? Jesus, better than anybody, know what the worth of a man is, right? And if any of you have not realized that, whether it's about yourself or whether it's about that coworker that you find very annoying, or that friend at school that you find very, whatever way you may find them, right? And you have not placed that kind of estimation upon them. I want to invite you to stand up, all right? And the second appeal I want to make is, is that, you know, Jesus says lay up treasure, right? We discovered today that that treasure are people, right? The treasure is souls that he had died for. And today I want to invite you that you would today start thinking about someone that you want to reach for Jesus, whether it's a coworker or a classmate. And, and you know, when we think about reaching out to someone, a lot of times we can, we have a very narrow view, right? We see going and knocking on the door and hitting out a blow track, right? That's only one of the many ways you can, right? Sometimes it's, so, it's just offering up a prayer. Sometimes it's just giving them an invitation, right? You know, you know how many of Jesus' disciples were gathered? You know how they were gathered? Their friends invited them, right? Philip went and got Bartholomew, right? Um, Andrew went and got Simon Peter, right? They were calling each other, like, hey, come, right? So this is simply what it means to reach out, right? There are people in your circle, there are people at work, at school, that only you can reach, right? So me from the pulpit cannot do that. Only you can do. There are people that only you can touch. And if there is someone like that in your life that you want to reach, I want to also invite you to stand up um, as we pray and ask the Lord to not only show us humanity to, to his eyes, but that he will help us to um, work earnestly for them um, as we are seeking to lay up treasures that will not perish. And before we pray, I just want to sing our closing hymn. I think it's hymn number 467. Hymn number 467, Rescue the Perishing. Okay, it's not 467. Somebody help me out. 367. I know it was 67. It's 367. Rescue the Perishing. <clears throat>